I see your familiar faces from last night, so uh, I hope you're already sober and you had a decent amount of sleep. But of course you don't, so I'll make it easier for you. It's the second day of Black Hat, it's 9 a.m., and you're attending the session discussing the believability and effectiveness of deception technologies, or per more particularly, how to beat modern deception. But if you came to this session so early this morning, it's because you're smart enough to realize that deception will shape the way we practice security. And in order to stay up to date with the industry, it's important to understand the advantages and disadvantages of deception. And if you are in the offensive side or in the security uh, industry, I'm warning you that if you underestimate the effectiveness and capabilities of deception, you will fall prey. But before we move to uh, deception and counter deception, let me introduce myself. My name is Matan Hart. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Symptom, a cybersecurity company specializing in adversary simulation. I have previously spoke in uh, several security conferences, including Black, Black Hat and B-Site San Francisco. And I warn you that I'm an ex-professional poker player, so if you see me on the uh, poker tables tonight, don't play with me. And if you don't see, if you don't recognize by the theme of this presentation, it's because I really like the TV show Mr. Robot. Let's move right to uh, the concept behind deception, where attackers have some kind of a motive and tactics trying to get to some prime target inside the organization. And deception is trying to disrupt the capabilities of, of the attacker by putting misleading information in his path in order to lure him to some kind of a trap along the way that should be only accessed by a malicious or at least suspicious uh, uh, hacker. And from there, it's for the security teams, it's much easier to detect and respond for attacks because it should be only accessed by some kind uh, of uh, suspicious uh, adversary. Uh, when we look about uh, deception, actually it might surprise you, but it started more than two te decades ago in the early 90s where with honeypots were facing the internet or were sitting in DMZ. But however, is there didn't really have some kind of uh, significant impact on the way we practice security because they were naive enough and were more, more for research intention than to really catch attackers. However, with the technology advancements in our life, uh, uh, especially uh, virtualization and the maturity of organization to start and detect attacks inside the perimeter, open the opportunity for deception technologies to improve and to be much more scalable. The architecture behind deception technologies is very different from what we've seen before. And it starts from uh, the, fir the first component, which is real assets inside the organization, which play a significant role because they are the initial reach point of an attacker. And from there, the deception is injecting the second component, which are baits, which lure an attacker into the third component, which is a detection mechanism. So each kind of a, uh, of a bait has a different detection method, starting with breadcrumbs, which are passive information that when the attacker gathers them during his reconnaissance, will in some kind of allure him into interacting with a decoy, which is a server or workstation that uh, should be only accessed by unauthorized use. Uh, commercial deception technologies make it a way further and they even emulate Swift systems and um, mainframes so it's, it might be, so the breadcrumbs are, might be very diverse. The second, com the second uh, part is our honey tokens which are uh, anything that is not like a, de like a decoy but any kind of access to it is monitored in a way that detect the attacker it can be some kind of a log analysis system that from workstation or from um, a central repository as well as some kind of a networking, a network sensor used like in intrusion detection systems. The third uh, option is our canaries which are uh, anything that once are tapped or used will phone home to some kind of a beacon, a server that uh, will um, alert with the information of the attacker in his location. The effectiveness, in my opinion, of deception technologies are, are, are basically in two factors. The first one is the probability of an attacker to even interfere and to confront some kind of a deception along his attack path. Because there are so many styles 
uh, attacker can, uh, different attackers uh, may use, and of course the level of, of their sophistication uh, will affect, will, will require from the deception technology to be diverse as much as it can, as well as if the attacker see that deception but it's not uh, really believable, it won't be effective. So the success rate of detecting a sophisticated attacker is by those two components. Uh, if we look about the more than deception technology, they really excel at being diverse and they can be in different places in the security stack. Uh, first are in the network with mounting network shares or broadcasting authentication that tools like Responder uh, will, it will be enticing to uh, poison as well in the endpoint pointing some kind of uh, interesting and attractive vulnerabilities. Uh, credentials are very common with deception technologies where they inject them into um, uh, strategic places in, in the network. Then, then you can use tools like Mimikatz to dump them and once you use them, um, uh, the, some kind of a log analysis or uh, a network sensor will detect them. On the application, it's very common to use uh, browsers in order to uh, put some uh, um, fake information in history bookmarks, cookies, and so on to lure an attacker into interacting with some kind of a decoy. And also there are interesting and cool stuff with doing uh, Git and SVN repositories uh, that will lure an attacker uh, to think that it's a uh, code of the organization and so on. On the data, emails and documents are very um, popular and what's, and during the attack, when the attacker collects those information, he may, he may think that is uh, gaining some kind of interesting data or um, trying to lure him into interacting with a decoy. But all, all this won't affect too much if the deception itself won't be believable in order to, to detect more sophisticated attackers. And more than deception, know that the average attacker is more than a bit, is not naive anymore, and it requires some kind of uh, making the story really fit uh, during the, uh, when the attacker, during the attack cycle of the attacker. And in order to do that, they're really working hard to update and maintain uh, places where the attacker gather information. And so if you talk about DTCP and DNS uh, records that, they're com that they make sure that the honeypot has been registered in, as well as in the ARP cache um, place. And uh, in the Active Directory, of course, if some kind of a domain credential are being injected uh, somewhere, they make sure that there is a really Active Directory user corresponding to that account that is maintained with information that looks that this user is really legitimate as well as active. On the decoys, some services might even be highly interactive, emulating a real services that an attacker can um, uh, interact with for a few hours just to realize that it's a decoy, allowing the security teams uh, enough time to, uh, to detect his uh, motivation as well as um, Remediate the attack. Another thing that I thought about is that I've, I saw in a few commercial deception technologies are the, the option to put information on the internet that once it's even inside the network, uh, the attacker will check the information outside, such as LinkedIn accounts of employees, and deception technologies are even capable of putting fake LinkedIn accounts that even if the attacker thinks that he's, he saw a um, a, a employee in the, uh, the organization, it will uh, fall. Uh, sorry, we will fall uh, a prey. Um, if you like this, if you find this interesting, or you don't believe me, you can watch a few friends of researchers from Elusive Networks discussing about that uh, at DEFCON on Saturday. So, as you can see, the dis the the, um, the effectiveness of deception is as sorry, has been uh, improved very much during the uh, last few years. And as an attacker, it's very important to know that because if you are some kind of uh, penetration tester or red teamer, according to Gardner, 10% of enterprises are already using deception tactics and tools, so there is a good chance that during your next engagement, you will encounter some kind of a detection of a deception technology. So let's discuss about counter deception. From the attacker perspective, the number of fake information you can gather might be higher than the number of real information, which means that if you choose a random attack vector, there is a high chance that it's gonna be fake and you're gonna, uh, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get caught 
which means that we are playing against the odds. So, so what we need to do here is actually some kind of a filtering method in order to distinguish between good and bad and increase our chances. So before we get to the stuff that really work, let's see what doesn't work. So first, going with your gut feeling, something I don't recommend. I know that some hackers think that they're smartest and uh, they know everything, but uh, deception providers hire hackers exactly like you in order to understand your psychology and how you think in order to give you the best deception uh, and you won't know where it comes from. Also, if you think that uh, you're going to find some kind of uh, sorry plot holes uh, where the deception itself is not credible enough, as I've shown you before, they make sure that the entire story fits into the, um, into the attacker uh, attack life cycle, uh, which make it very easy to go for the lowest hanging fruit uh, and it might look very convincing. Also, if you think that you're going to find that some kind of a pattern that is only for the deception, like some kind of a name convention that does not fit to the organization, uh, commercial deception technology use fancy machine learning today in order to understand the infrastructure of the specific organization in order to blend in uh, and make it much more, much harder for an attacker to see any uh, distinguishable pattern. Also, what I thought about trying is to isolate the endpoint and, and monitoring the ejection points of the deception in order to find some kind of uh, uh, where, there deception, where those deception are being getting inside that computer. However, because deception have been in the in the um, in the computer before you, you may not notice and know what's uh, been there before. And also, I thought about trying to blocking the communication outside of that endpoint in order to stop. Uh, canaries as well as other um, alerting um, uh, systems, but you don't know how they do it uh, and on what scale, so it's very hard to distinguish and to try to monitor everything. And then I thought, okay, maybe we shouldn't play the game that deception technology are trying to make you play. They have, they have their uh, better, um, they're in favor in this, uh, they have the advantages over you in that scenario, so we, maybe we shouldn't try to change the game. So as a poker player, I thought about it. When you have a ca cards, you, you don't really play with the cards you have dealt. Sometimes you play the, the people, the, the opponent you're up against. And when you look about deception technologies, you understand that at the end of the day, they are just a product that they need to correspond to the organizational um, um, needs and limitations. And when you look about the uh, weakest points of deception, there is a, a a balance where they need to do, to be so as, as they want to be authentic as possible, but at the other side, they cannot increase the risk and the attack surface of the organization as well as they cannot disrupt business operation. So think about it that if you're a CFO in the 60s and there is a deception with Excel file on his desktop, first he can freak out that he didn't really write this file, and second of all, he can interact with that file because he's curious to know what it is, and it will uh, um, generate false positive, which uh, the deception doesn't want to really happen. As well as if you uh, put domain admins in the, uh, sorry, if you put domain admins in the uh, organization, you can't really know uh, if you let the attacker you get that deception, if you might uh, really use it and make the disruption even for five seconds. So let's have a look and see an uh, example of a uh, situation where there's some kind of a file that the attacker see uh, a folder that looks interesting and convincing, uh, but as if for the user, the end user that is his computer, his, his folder will contain only the files he have created. So if this, that the attacker is smart enough to understand that deception technology cannot really uh, allow the real user to see that file, he can check the attributes of that folder and see that it's been that specific user has been restricted to use that file as well as it's been hidden from him. Um, so, you know, if you're smart and you, you don't need to be smart, you just need to have common sense, you can realize that the average user won't hide uh, files and folders and restrict his access from uh, his own files. Let's let you uh, have uh, a chance to see if you can uh, see the difference between um, a, the fake and the uh, good information. So two sessions here, two command lines uh, with a net user uh, checking the attributes of a domain user. 
uh, which are both of them domain admins. Do you see any difference that is, can be distinguishable between what is fake and what is real? I hope you can see it from far behind. I will make it easier for you if you don't see. Have a look at specific where I circle right now. Do you see any differences in those two attributes? So I guess you don't. However, if you check it more closely uh, with the command lines, they are not the same. And the reason for that, I've seen this uh, trick in a few commercial deception technologies, is that they put uh, in the Logan workstation, uh, they restrict the access for uh, the account, which is a domain admin, to work only on a specific workstation which called all. And of course, there is no computer called all, which means that you have a domain admin that cannot log to any computer, and with that way, they minimize the risk of the uh, attack. And when you try to connect, of course, with that account, you get some kind of a citation log that is monitored, alerting the SOC that uh, a, a decoy account has been used. And then I try to outsmart that deception and uh, try to make an attack that doesn't require you require to authenticate to a computer like a desync attack and I realized that they also made some kind of a full control deny access control list on the domain object restricting the account to do anything in the domain. So uh, when I saw that there are so many uh, opportunities for deception technology to restrict the access of the attacker uh, in order to limit is to reduce the risk as well as to um, uh, reduce the friction with employees, I decided to make a tool that really checked the effective rights of the user, uh, calculating the entire um, uh, rights that he has in order to know what it's exactly he can or cannot do. So it, it's basically work with any, uh, any, any kind of data that uh, a user can have access to it. So before you choose an account to attack with, choose what is really is access. And if there is some kind of a limitation that is, shouldn't be, you should know that it's a decoy. So in, as in poker, when you put an all in, because you're gonna risk everything if you don't have a hand or you think you have a hand but there's maybe a better hand than you, deception technologies are limited by uh, actual uh, organizational trade-off that they cannot really let them uh, introduce more risk. And it's not a technology gap, it's actually more um, uh, organizational gap. That unless organization will change their strategy into something like they know that once they're breached, the attacker will have uh, full compromise of the network, so maybe we should change the game again and let them, um, and let them uh, a, Win, uh, win the, um, and exploit the organization, but try to detect and remediate the attack afterwards. So uh, I would like to conclude the presentation with three uh, points for you. First is that the, the, the effectiveness of deception technologies is determined by how much believable it can be and how diversity and scalable it can be in order to increase the probability to detect attacks. The weakest point in deception is actually business trade-offs that they must do in order to uh, remain, to not increase the attack surface of the organization as well not to freak out or to interact or disrupt business operations. And if you're in the uh, practicing offense and you encounter uh, and you're doing engagement where there's some kind of a deception technology in place, you should try to exploit the precautions that deception, that the, uh, organiz the deception provider have to take in order to distinguish between good and bad. So uh, we have time for questions. I uh, will take them right now. Um, if you are shy enough, uh, if you're too shy or you don't have the time right now, uh, I think I'm friendly, so you can always uh, contact me with Twitter or in the mail. Thank you very much.